thanks for thanks for having me. So I expect to see my screen. Um, awesome. Yes. So let me start. My talk is called Mastering Design Systems Components in Figma. And um, I will start very quickly about uh, something about me. I work as a design system lead at, at uh, Product Board. What is Product Board? We are, we are a company, we are a SaaS tool, uh, B2B tool for product managers. Uh, we, uh, we <clears throat> sorry. We want to help product managers to understand better what their customers needs, uh, help to prioritize what to build next, and, and of course, uh, help them to build and share their roadmaps. Before product board, I, I was managing the design system, design system at Kiwi, uh, as it was mentioned by Sylvia, thank you. And I work all, also as a sport, sport company, Live Sport, and, um, and, some, uh, and some more. So what we will learn today, I hope that we will learn today from my presentation, um, I will talk a bit about API design, I will definitely talk a bit more about the UI Kit principles, and then I would like to get in file and maybe show you some <clears throat> hacks and hacks and tricks how to um, work with some components, how to work with minimal height, minimal width, and so on. So let's talk a bit about API design. Uh, I know it's an, a term that is not super common in a design world. It's more common in um, in a code, but uh, what is an API design then? Uh, it's, it's the way each component can be controlled by users that are, that are using um, the component. In, in code, it looks like something like this. This is an example from React. We have a, a name, button primary, then we have size, different sizes. Uh, we can put an icon there. We can uh, have more attributes there, which may be super specific to code. And then of course we have a label. <clears throat> and there may be a several ways how to approach this API. This is only uh, one of them. In Figma, um, components have API as well. Uh, components uh, is uh, the first thing, like how you structure them, if it's a uh, components or variant or how you name them. You also have layers and how you work with them, how you name the layers, how you, how you group them. And of course, uh, variant knobs. So an example, an example of this alert alert component, which can have some action. It can have uh, it can be even in line, and you can see this uh, is actually a beta of interactive components, which doesn't work super well. Anyway, we have a components layer, which we decided here to split the component between two, two components, alert banner and inline alert banner. I will talk about this later a bit more. Then we have all the layers that are. In the component, uh, some can be hidden. It does something there, of course. And then we have, of course, the variant knobs that are possibly the most visible visible API of component uh, in Figma. So um, when I was uh, creating components for design system, I realized one important thing that it's super different if you design components that you will be using and only you will be using because uh, you know them then, and and uh, components that, that other people will be using. Let me let me explain this a bit more. For example, as a, someone who main, maintains the UI kit and creates the components, you probably know all the components and variants in the system because you touched all of them. You also know the inner structure of each component, how you group things, how you name things, and so on. But designers designers uh, who are using the component only using and not build it, they probably don't know the, these things. You also understand common use cases mostly because uh, ideally you documented them or you've seen them elsewhere in the app. Some designers uh, know this, some not. You also have a deeper knowledge of visual language because you are working with that visual language every day. And not, 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 this, not every designer who is using components is uh, a skilled in, in interaction design or, or UI, UI design that much. <clears throat> so uh, only some of them know that. Uh, you, very probably have a master in all the Figma queries and hacks because Figma is uh, for design at least is, uh, is your uh, tool of choice and you are looking for all the updates, you are checking all the documentation and you are trying to figure things out there. Some designers, again, some designers have, have this, who are using components, some not. And you also have the knowledge what's in code, hopefully at least. Uh, that's, that's why it's design system, right? Uh, Every other designers who are using a component system don't have this knowledge. But what is interesting, that even if you build some components in, uh, in Figma and design system, after some time, you will uh, start uh, forgetting these things. So you 
won't know about all the components. If you have like tens of components or maybe even hundreds or hundreds of variants, you won't uh, remember all of them. You will definitely don't remember how you built uh, that alert banner, if there are some layers which are hidden or not, for example. And uh, deep knowledge of visual language is, uh, is kind of like tricky because visual language is still evolving. So you may be confused what is what is currently um, like the latest or what, what was uh, deprecated, for example. <clears throat> so if we ask a typical design question, like how might we keep our components predictable across the whole system so it's easy to use them? Um, I believe that having something like UI, UI kit principles helps. And what are UI kit principles? UI kit principles uh, basically sets a precedent on how each component in the design system is built. They keep uh, foundational decisions consistent, of course, predictable, while leaving some, some like wiggling or uh, flexibility uh, for specific components. And they should be, I believe that they should be tool agnostic. So it, it doesn't matter if you, use uh, Figma or Sketch or Adobe XD or, or some other tool in the future, those UI kit principles should uh, still like be informing your, your decisions, even if you switch uh, to different tool. So how does these uh, UI kit principles uh, look like uh, at Product Board? We have uh, five of them, or, or uh, we define these five that helps us to maintain and govern our components make frequent choices efficient, always favor usability, take away visual decisions, handle breaking changes in advance, and bridge the gap. And now uh, to make it more like tangible for you, <clears throat> I will go through each of them and I will show you some examples how um, we work with these principles exactly in, in Figma. So making frequent choices efficient is, uh, for, for me at least, I believe it's one of the most important things there because um, if, some button is used frequently several times a day by several designers, they should be super fast in using them. And it, that comes to every, every component, comp component basically. <clears throat> so what we do, sorry. So what we do is that we set the most frequent variant as default. And that means that we will place the, the component to the, to the left top corner, which will also work as a preview for that. And if we check, for example, data in Figma analytics, we can see that the, usually if uh, designers are using tooltip, they use top center tooltip with, uh, with the arrow in the center. And um, we want them to be like able to use this component as fast as possible. So they don't need to put the component there and then change it to top center. It should be there uh, from uh, as default. This is a simple example, but let's let's check a different example. For example, here this alert banner uh, that I already shown you showed you is that uh, we have uh, those like five or five uh, um, knobs there, because there is a lot of different variants. There are actions. There is a clo closing closing uh, button. Uh, it's an inline. It's not inline. Uh, and what we did, so we did, we released this and we let designers to work with that. And then after some time, we check data how designers are using those components and we notice that they mostly they use the like uh, non, non inline variant with actions however this was the default variant every time they need they put this component on the canvas they needed to hit actions to show them that's a cognitive load that's also like another click and it may seem like small but if you do this like several times per week it it saves you some time and we also noticed that, that uh, <clears throat> Almost the same time, it was used in the inline variations. So what we did is we took those data, and we redesigned the API of the component. <clears throat> we split this one component into two components. Uh, one is inline, second is false. So it's super fast to actually pick one they need, and we uh, made actions as default in this other component. So uh, it meant that. The benefit of this was that fewer clicks uh, were needed to get a variant the designers need. And of course, it also shows a better search previews in assets panel because it shows the two different components and they can decide directly from the search uh, or assets panel if they want to use inline or not. Again, like two uh, safe clicks per each use. Another very, very useful 
of things that we do is having each distinctive variant as a separate component. Again, we, we check, we also check the data and analytics, but for example, you can have this one a button with, I don't know, 500, 600 variants, different colors, different types. And then you can, you can uh, let designers to actually pick their variant here. What is a problem that every time they uh, search for button, they see only this one blue and uh, list of components doesn't say anything about, hey, we have five, six, eight more types of the buttons. So what we did is that we separated each button type into its own component. That like the first benefit of that is that it's more maintainable for, uh, for me as a design designer, because I don't have a super large large components with 600 variants. I have them with, I know, uh, 80 or 90. But more importantly, every time that someone searches for button, it will list all the different distinctive variants and they can, they can uh, pick it very, very quickly. And it's not about components only, it's also about, about styles. For example, we put um, our semantic styles for foreground, background, and some, some common UI element styles to the top. So every time designer opens the style panel, uh, it's there. The, this one is the most basic style for text. But if they need uh, a power of the full color palette, because we support a lot of different different uh, colors and types, they can scroll down and pick, pick uh, from extended palettes. <clears throat> Again, this is saving time. It also helps uh, in discoverability what, what colors are the main. <clears throat> Second principle is always favoring usability. I believe that designers shouldn't spend much time learning on how to use it, and it should be clear from the from the system, and it should be hard to do the wrong thing. For example, uh, if we have two variants, uh, we can implement it in a, in several ways. For example, in these two, we can implement it as uh, hidden layers with inline actions with close buttons, and we can we can let designers to figure it out. Yes, it's, it's easily maintainable for us because we don't need to maintain uh, three times more variants, but when you use it, it's harder. And it, it's harder to actually discover because I don't believe it that everyone is opening this layers panel to check what hidden layers are there. So if we surface it uh, into variants, yes, it's, it's harder to maintain it in the, in the long time, but it's super easy to use. We also surface actual instructions because not all components can have um, knobs on the top top level because that would mean that just for supporting like uh, three different types of headers and uh, four different types of um, of uh, metadata, we would need to maintain like eight hundred components or something like that. So where we help each, uh, what we do to help us a bit is actually using some compo some sub components that have their own variants. But again, that would mean the designers need to know <clears throat> that there are two different components so they can play with the variants. Uh, so what we do now is that we surface this information into HSW subcomponents with those small umbrellas there uh, because it's basically an umbrella component and we have uh, several subcomponents with all variants there. We also surface some, some small information there like um, what is the common use for this uh, or if there's some, for example, some rela like related component like numeric badge. I am not a fan of this like contrast choice uh, from Figma designers, uh, but I hope this like design documentation gets, gets better there. Um, and this one is my favorite, like um, <clears throat> keeping variant knobs and, and their order consistent is something that um, basically helps to make less errors. As an example, we have three different or eight different components that have uh, state. So state is always the last knob in the list, because that means that if you want to switch it into hover, you know that you can you can uh, like semi automatically go to the state and uh, select it. We also keep the order order here uh, consistent uh, to some extent, at least. Um, so hover is always second. Focus is is uh, is following after hover. And I see I have a bug here, but no, I don't. Uh, active is actually following after hover. If there is an active state, then, then there is a focus. And that's also applies for, for colors. So if we have if we are supporting a component with several colors, the order of the colors is still the same. So you know that the yellow is always somewhere in the middle, which helps you to be fast when you are <coughs> picking the correct uh, 
correct uh, variant. So taking away visual decisions um, is mostly about like consistency and also about like not forcing designers to to decide on things how uh, like which color should be used there and so on. I have one example here, a uh, simple one. Uh, you probably all do this, but if we support like uh, 10 different colors for all our um, statuses, uh, it should be it should be um, defined as variants because we shouldn't like uh, for us to know that the blue variant or purple variant is using a 500 color shade, but the yellow for some visual reasons is using 400 and the same of course for for hovers and so on and so on. So this should this all should be defined as variants. Even that, of course, it makes uh, makes it a bit harder to to maintain. But uh, for using, it's much better. This one uh, is super important if you are working with uh, in a team because if you break something in in your in your components, it may delete all the data the designers uh, have in their prototypes, and you you want to avoid that. You don't want that. So what we do is that we change visual properties and we don't remove layer. I will I will show you an interactive example here. So let's let's check this component. Like let's let's break things first. Like we have this uh, main component here. We have these instances used somewhere in the prototype, um, and we decided that we we actually want to change it into a bit different layout. So what we can do is that we can we can take this from some explorations. We can uh, replace it in the component. And now we have a new component with all the new styles, which is awesome. It was fast, right? It was a few seconds for me now. But what happened is that all the data the designers had in their prototypes were uh, recepted into default variants. And you want to avoid this. You can see the preserved state, how it looked. This is how it looks. If this happened to prototype that, that is being tested in user the session, I, I guarantee you that, that your designers will hate you for this. So uh, there is a other way how to do it. Like you, what you can do is basically uh, move things around without without um, actually uh, removing them and replacing them. So you can you can even change their styles. You can you can even change. Um, I don't know. We don't need this. Uh, you can even move things from different different uh, locations. You can you can add things there, and as you can see, it changed the structure here, but the content state, which is great, which is what you want to achieve. But of course, it's not always possible. However, it was it was slower because I need to do it for this variant now as well. I right, so I will quickly switch it. You get the idea, I guess. Um, However, uh, there is one more thing. If you, for example, decide to add something to, to that component, like, like a title, for example, you can see that it, it adds a title here. Let's move this away again. So you have a title here, but because it's a new element, it's also a breaking change because if, if someone is testing this, they will, they will have like all the new titles there that they just don't want to have there. So this is a breaking change as well. Even adding new components may be a brain breaking change. So this is important to realize. And if there is or when there is a no option, other option than break it, because for example, you want to change also, also some, um, some other things. What we do usually is that we adjust the name of the component, we add emoji, this one specific emoji there, uh, we add info that is deprecated. We also add it to the description, so it's everywhere. We uh, add also what should be used instead. And what is great, if I search for that, you can see that because we have a red background on that, it's directly from this panel, it's, it's uh, visible uh, that the component is deprecated. If you hover it, there is also uh, this description. Also, it's visible here in the name. So this is, this is how, we, how we work with non-breaking and non-breaking changes. And it's something that super, super helps. Uh, and how to know if you should choose the approach with moving layers and, and changing their style, 
or uh, deciding that you will break it uh, or you will deprecate it is that um, you can check your Figma analytics. You can, you can check how many times the component is used it, when it was used um, like last time, if it's used in files that are still uh, like um, latest or current or being implemented or tested, and you can decide based on these data. Um, the fifth principle is bridging the gap because design is only one part of the equation. Like if you, we talk about design systems, we need to talk about design and code part always. Uh, because until our designs are implemented, they are just polystatic images in Figma and no one, no, no users can, can see them. So what we uh, want to achieve with this principle is that we want to help developers to navigate very quickly to get what they need from designs, for example, in handoffs. So what we do for all our components in the design system is that we communicate the code availability for them. We always add info if a component is available in React, we always add it into the description, which is then visible in inspect. And if it's not available in React, we edit the information there as well, but we also add a prompt to developers if they want to contribute it into the design system uh, during their activities. And then we, of course, go through a contribution process in code. For some components like <clears throat> like icons, we even add uh, the imports imports there because it, it's just as easy as copy it and pa paste it into into uh, code editor. And of course, one last thing: if there is a if it's already available in React, we also add a link to documentation so they can click it and they can see the API of the React component uh, very quickly. We do the similar thing for to for tokens or color styles or effect styles because every color style, every effect style has a counterpart in code, uh, which we uh, call design tokens, and there will be um, talk about them later. What we do is that we start with some like more human friendly name, so designers uh, can read and they don't need to orient and uh, or navigate through uh, like variable name through code. Uh, and we also can leverage this for, for better grouping. And then to the end of each name, we will add a name uh, into brackets. We will add a name of the variable, be it a color or be it a uh, shadow or I don't know what else. I think that's that's it. <clears throat> and this helps uh, to surface information there. We don't add it into descriptions because descriptions are not visible for start. They are not visible in inspect panel, so it would be use useless. What we also do is that we try to align uh, knobs, as I call them, like variant knobs in Figma with layer names uh, and layer names in Figma with what we have in React. So if we have this component, which we uh, call illustrated message, you can see that its structure here is a stack, which is a layouting component in code. Uh, there is a button primary there used, there is another stack, and there is description and title. We can see the description and title are properties uh, and they're the same as in code. So if, if, design, if developers are taking these, uh, working with these components, they can uh, easily map it into what they have in their API. So just to recap, like our UI principles, ma making frequent choices efficient, always favoring usability, even over maintainability, uh, taking away visual decisions, handling breaking changes in advance, so we don't bring designs from other designers, and uh, bridging, bridging the gap uh, between Figma and code. So key take takeaways are, are uh, from this part of talk, letting UI kit, kit principles guide your components, make it hard to do the wrong thing, and work with data as much as possible because there are like so many valuable insights there. So that it was the first part of the talk. And now I would like to show you a few tips. It will be uh, much less structured than, than this was. Uh, but I hope it will be it will be uh, useful uh, for you as well. So one one common trick uh, which is um, often mentioned in community are zero size frames. What does it mean zero size frame? It, it means that you can have a frame and you can set its size to zero. So it's basically invisible, but you can place things inside, which is super helpful for some some uh, tricks. So how can that be used? Like <clears throat> one common use case uh, for us is actually being sure that our components, for example, these small badges are not uh, like squeezed because 
of course, if we have like a longer uh, content there, it's, it's, it's okay. But if we have like uh, one single character, it's not a circle, which uh, of course is not, not uh, something that we want to achieve. So what we do is that we, we have this min width filler, which has like a zero height, but it says that uh, it has a bit of eight pixels. So we basically ensure that min width of this element is, is always, always uh, in, uh, in this, this uh, circle uh, frame. Also, it's super in, uh, great for if you have a minimal width for button, for example, because we can have OK here and it's still aligning somehow, but we can have uh, a longer label and you want it to grow uh, because of auto layout. So that's the very similar trick. We have, uh, you know, here we have a minimal width layer. Uh, which is saying, okay, so this is the minimal width of the of the button. It the same is actually here. But there is more you can do. You can do also minimal height. For example, for text areas, you can you can say, okay, so this is a text area, and it shouldn't be smaller than, um, sorry, it shouldn't be smaller than sixty pixels. So we can we can we can do this. But if we if we add content there it can grow as much as we want. This trick is the same. We have the minimal minimal height hack here, um, this, which is a zero, zero width. So it doesn't take any space in, uh, in the component. It works also for more complex components uh, if we wanted to do it like this. It also helps with flexible positioning. Uh, we can have tags uh, and those tags can have some, some a closing closing icon there, but we want it to be to be flexible. You want it to work with an auto layout. So what we do here is we basically uh, create the min width uh, container and then we move this. And because it's uh, not auto layout, this uh, zero width frame, we can actually position it in any way we want outside of the auto layout. Um, of course, if you if you use the auto layout and you have, for example, uh, error messages like this. You can you can even enable them and test them in your prototypes, and it won't affect the flow of the auto layout because it's the component is like this, and there is this uh, tool deposition which is again like zero to zero, and the whole uh, content of the tooltip is is there. So uh, and this this one is um, is another another uh, useful thing. For example, how you can work with that if you have, for example, hover effect for some card. Which is uh, showing uh, some elements on top of current card. Uh, the way we do this is that we have this overlay wrapper, which, as you can see, has a zero height. But there is a lot of content in there. Like you can have like any other content there. Um, you can then move this uh, to any location you want. You can you can change this to even like a full color. You can do whatever you want with that. It can be very flexible there. And then of course you can have uh, auto layout here. Because, because why not? That's that, that's the way how it works. Uh, so this was a zero size frame. Another thing that we <clears throat> have uh, very often in our app are some progress bars. And uh, what sometimes designers need is to have a flexible flexible width of um, of um, of this blue bar. But not every time. So what we what we uh, do is that we will create this like 25, 50%, the most common choices. But we also have the custom one where you can, oh, come on, you can select this, this bar and do whatever you want. I don't zoom it a bit and do whatever you want. So how, how, how does this work? It's actually a uh, hack with auto layout because even on instances, you can override override um, auto layout properties. So what, what is here is that the bar is made of two blocks, which are one is on the left, uh, second is on the right. And the auto layout position in between them is defining the width of this uh, progress bar. You can, you can do this, of course, with uh, even with com combination uh, with the, the zero height uh, hack, uh, sorry, zero width. Again, this is custom. And then what we have here, we have this like zero, zero width peg he, uh, frame here, which is posi positioning this, uh, this dot here. I can change it here, I guess. 
Okay, I can change it here if I want to. So there can be anything there. It works also for stacked stacked bars. Um, for example, if we let's uh, let's copy this uh, several times. If we want uh, only a few bars there, because I don't know, it's a um, summary of some some values in in a list. Uh, we can do it. We can delete them, and because of the auto layout and some properties have, have auto here uh, as um, as the width, they will fill the uh, the content completely. Or we can uh, change them because we want this one this one larger. We want this one smaller, or something like this. And this could be twenty as well. And we can do basically whatever we want with that. Uh, or we can we can delete this, and then we have the the empty area here. So that, that's pretty flexible when you work with thick bars and so on. One last piece <clears throat> are content slots. Um, content slots are like great for flexible content inside of more complex components. Let me show it on examples. For example, we have this sidebar here, and we know that sidebar can have search. It doesn't need to have search. It can have footer or not. Um, it even has some subcomponents like it can have back, it can have uh, more here, and so on. So we don't want designers to put this together all the time because um, there is some auto layout magic that uh, just try uh, takes some time to figure. So what we do is that we uh, add this content slot component there, then we create the content for the for the sidebar which you can see as, as a component because this is a component as well, I can swap it in instance panel to user's content. What it will do is that it, uh, it will fill the content from this there. Um, what is the great thing is that I can hide the search if I want to, it still works. I can hide even hide a footer, it still works. And what is, what is even better if I, if I go to prototype, mode um, let's scroll down it actually scrolls because this master component or main component has uh, has said that this everything that is inside of the content slot is scroll scrollable and you can see uh, how quickly you are you are able to put together your own content because you can put any content here uh, if you want um, we, we have more slots like this, like uh, we don't allow to switch everything, but there are some slots that are more, that are usually more um, flexible. So for example, in this component, I can switch this with users and I can switch with this with, um, let me check the name, custom header content, uh, custom header content. And because it's all auto, auto layouted, it works uh, perfectly. So this is how designers can extend our components. Um, just to check, uh, just to show you, we have this like checkbox and label variant here, but we also have the custom variant if you if you uh, want something more complex, for example. Uh, and we use this like uh, in. Um, for example, in dialogues, because um, there are some dialogue types that are very common, something like confirmation, or we have this dialogue style where we know that user needs to confirm something before they can continue, or there can be basically anything there. And, and as you can see, I can even like uh, switch and show alert here. I can make it as destructive. Uh, so we have this with custom content here, which will show the content slot, I still can show the alert. I still can show uh, make it destructive, but I can switch content inside um, flexible. The same thing here is here. For example, accordions or sections. We have this expanded option here, so it it uh, switches this. It uh, changes the background and everything. Uh, but you can put anything there because there are so many variations what can be inside. But this is a great because this all this will stay connected to components. So if we decided we will change the styling of this in Figma library, it will be updated correctly. And we have uh, also this one here. Uh, this is a select, for example, and let me change this um, in the default state. And you can open open it. It will change the state of focus because that's how it how it works and how this is how our system is defined. And it will show uh, the content here that you can basically replace. So, so this would be, I think, all, all examples I, I have prepared.
what is here next? Yes, uh, we are hiring. We are hiring uh, for a designer. We are hiring also like designer for other roles, for other tribes. So if you if you are looking for a job, we are open to uh, remote Europe. Feel free to reach to me or use this this quick link here uh, to find it. And that it will be all. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh wow, Honza! <laughs> wow. <Thank> <laughs> I can say on behalf of everyone amazing. else, because I'm reading the comments, it's amazing. It's breathtaking, really. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, like, I didn't like invent these hacks. Like, I'm just like <laughs> following what's happening on Twitter, and there are so much smarter people than me uh, that are actually playing and spending a lot of time in Figma and trying to hack it as much as possible. And we just like do these hacks and somehow apply them to, to our UI kit. Uh, to leverage them well and you certainly brought it up uh, a nice um yeah way to present it you know to walk through like the principles and then quickly like a wizard show like clicking around <laughs> you do it really quickly as well people are saying like oh i wish i could pause it i need to pay attention <laughs> so and and uh, sylvia already <laughs> mentioned that uh, we should yeah, Steve uh, also wrote that yeah go Sorry. <laughs> no worries, go. Go ahead. <laughs> go, go. I, was, uh, I just wanted to mention that, Steve already mentioned that. Hansa, you are my new favorite designer. Just incredible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we do have time for a bit of uh, uh, some questions oh, yeah. if so you're up for answering, like. Hansa. Of course, of course. Nice. Cool. So, um, well, the first one, is, and I guess it's an answer that. Yes. Also, we have somebody who wants to go live. Okay. Uh, let's let's go with the person live then. Can if you can allow them to unmute themselves. Sorry, I'm a, a little bit behind. Just a second. Okay, Daniel, you will be allowed to unmute yourself. Let's see. Hello, Hi. Hi. Hey. Uh, well, first Hi, of all, I wanna, uh, hey. uh, first of all, I want to say that everybody just said this was an amazing talk and super inspired by it. A uh, quick question on the principle of and breaking changes in advance. Um, I wonder how you kind of prevent. Uh, deprecated components piling up or design that uh, piling up uh, when you kind of never make any breaking changes. How do you handle it? Daniel, it seems that we are having some issues with your audio. I, I hope I, I understood correctly, so so I, I will be able to answer. Like yeah, that's a, that's a tricky link. Um, it's different for every component. Sometimes I just delete them. Sometimes I just uh, keep them in the library for some time. There is a good thing about Figma how it actually works with uh, components which are deleted from UIKit. It will still keeps them in instances, and they are still like kind of connected. But if you go to the main file, it it says it was deleted. So if you delete the component from from the library, like right away. It won't break anything, or it shouldn't break anything in Figma files, which is which is a great feature. However, however, if you change a name and then you will you will delete it and publish it, it won't uh, change uh, name, descriptions, and so on in, uh, in instances. So that's the reason why I'm keeping it in the library for some time, so people have actually time to to update uh, their component instances with this new info. Uh, well, thanks. That makes perfect sense. Uh, and adding to that, um, maybe another tip when setting up a, um, a UI library from scratch is that you really think, have to think about the structure of your UI library up front. Because if you then change the naming of all the components, then exactly this what will happen that all the nested components will lose their connection to the original component, and you kind of have to rewire all of them. Uh, Just to to me. <laughs> I think to add to this, like if you change name of the component or you move it between pages or something like that, it won't break anything. If you change name of the variant, if you change name of the component description, 
if you change visual stars, it shouldn't break everything uh, like anything because the components are are connected via some internal ID in Figma. So this should be okay. Um, Different in code, well. I'm not sure what the issue was, but yeah, maybe some maybe the issue lay some lay somewhere else. Well, thanks, anyways. Happy to happy to help. Thanks, Daniel, and uh, maybe have a check at your mic for future meetings. Uh, you're just having a bit of an issue, sounding a bit robotic. But uh, yeah, thank you anyway for uh, raising your hand. I think it's nice when we get to the public to well ask the question directly. And now uh, I do have some questions that are posted in our board, and also we're trying to capture them here from the chat. And the most voted one for now is, how did you analyze the component usage? Uh, okay, that's that can be a long, long answer. Like it depends. Is the short answer here? <laughs> but of course, it's not super helpful. Um, like it depends what I want to do. It's maybe maybe a better answer. But it depends part. Um, like if 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 we know that we want to remove some components or break some components because we want to evolve its uh, structure, information architecture, or something, we check Figma analytics for this. We will check. How many times it's used, as I, as I shown, uh, how many uh, files that are kind of new are using that, or we, we sometimes I even check like how it's used, if it's not just some exploration somewhere, but this doesn't scale well, it's, it's, but it's a manual effort. Um, also, like if I release a new component in the library, uh, I, I let it live for some, for a few weeks, for a few months, and after that I know that I want to go to to Figma analytics and set check which variants are, are used the most. And this helps, helps me to, for example, like split some components into several variants. Uh, and what is great, it's not a breaking change. Like even if I split, uh, like if I have a component with uh, 20 different variants and I will create 20 components from that, uh, it still doesn't need to be breaking change because you can just like move your variants out of the frame of, of component and then create a new component and it, it should it should uh, be still connected and sh it should still update. So I hope I answered even that I know the, the question is super, super wide. Yeah, no, it, it definitely helps uh, to get a glimpse or at least an idea on how to go about it. And of course there is the analytics uh, part that is available in Figma organizations, right? Yes, that, yeah, that's it. Um, like, of course, and sadly, it's not on team plan, not yet. At least I hope they will add it eventually. But uh, that that's one of the best features on on organization plan, which really helps to maintain in the library. Yep, and um, well, I guess the most voted thing that actually everybody would like, uh, and hopefully the answer is positive. Can you share the Figma file with us? Uh, yes, I will share a link to presentation, and I. I will prepare some file for the community with some like more explained things there because I think I broke everything now when I played with that during the talk, but I can I can share it. Nice. Yes, everybody. Oh, that's so nice. Thank Thanks. you so much. I mean, for preparing all of this content and giving this incredible talk, collecting all of those hacks and putting everything together. Amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, I guess we can cover one more question before we go into our next break. And yeah, uh, again, like the previous talks, uh, we probably could continue talking here the whole day because there are so many questions. But uh, yeah, I'm going to try to get them to the one that um, is the most voted next. Uh, how do you keep the components for designers separate from components that match developed components? Is it all in the same file or because you after you showed uh, that documentation side that you make those uh, or you add those icons to say uh, you can find it on react but do you uh, also physically keep them se separately in different libraries um, yeah it's more about the structure of our figma files like we have a separate library for theme which are colors shadows basically tokens uh then we have a separate library for ui icons and logos and then for ui components um and and something from these libraries is still connected to to code like uh, you we get for components we have this link to storybook or information that that it, that it is already in react or not for for icons we even have uh, like imports for react for uh, tokens colors we have the, this this small notice in the at the end of the each each uh, style name 
and uh, we maintain it manually. Like there is no automatic way currently that actually connects those two, two worlds. Uh, I am the automation part there <laughs> because, <laughs> because I, am, I am aware of what is happening in code. That was the hopefully part in the, in the comparison table. Uh, I know what is happening in code because I'm working with developers of in design system team. So, so that's uh, when we release a new component in React that was uh, that is based on some specification in Figma. I know that one of one part of our acceptance criteria is actually to put an info into a Figma component and link as well. Right. Nice. Cool to to see. It's um, yeah a, a good approach. I think that there is one source of truth. Um, and I guess uh, just before we go, there is a tip for you or a question. Do you have a YouTube channel? And if you don't, you should. I don't have a YouTube channel, but uh, I will think about it. I have a new mic, actually. So we, we are joking with my, my colleague that we need to start a podcast now because we have a, a microphone finally. Uh, but I'm not I'm sure if I'm not too shy for that. But thank you. Thank you for encouraging. <laughs> You're sure going to have the subscribers from uh, this uh, event, no doubt. <laughs> yes, yes, you should definitely do more content. Happy to help you with that. Maybe you would like to give another talk one day. Would be happy to support you because that it's amazing what you are presenting and everybody loves it in the chat. Yeah, so many cool. blessings. Yeah. So if you have some time then uh, Hansa to answer the questions that are on the middle board, we appreciate. I will. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there are many questions. I'm, I'm not sure what would be the best way for you to answer them. Maybe. I guess one by one. <laughs> <laughs> because some of them are also components. <laughs> it will be a lot of work, but thank you so much for doing that. Amazing. Thank Super you. Super so happy. Much. It was a pleasure having you around. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.